Dear friends, God's grace through Jesus far surpasses Adam's trespass and the death that ensued. While Adam's disobedience condemned us, Christ's obedience justified us unto righteousness. Join us to understand better on how the grace of God weighs far higher and encapsulates the stranglehold of sin and law. Hello, brothers and sisters. It is a great day to study the Word of God. I invite you all to join me in exploring through the Bible. But before we begin our study, let us have a quick recap of what we learned in our previous discussion. First, we learned that God loved us even while we were still sinners. He offered His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins, and no one on earth can demonstrate their love in this way. And this includes your loved ones and close friends. Though we are saved by grace, it does not negate the fact that God loves us and is still willing to save those who are lost. Secondly, we learned that since we are saved from the penalty of sin by grace, we no longer have to experience the wrath of God. For everyone will be in heaven with God if we believe. And there is no better way to celebrate this truth than to be filled with joy and rejoice in God who saved us from all eternal damnation. And finally, we discussed the sanctification of the saints. Though God declared us righteous, He has to transform us into the person He wants us to be. For only by the chains of heart can we be made righteous. Here, we also discuss the potential sanctification through the headship of Adam. We concluded that man was born a sinner through Adam. Sin has become a part of man. And so, to separate man from his sins and put an end to it, Christ died to take it away and gave us new life through his resurrection. Through Adam, sin entered the world and led us to death. But through Christ, Salvation was made available to us and gave us life. Christ's death on the cross was a sacrifice to cleanse us of our sins. But how much do we know about His resurrection and what it means to us? What do we know about Christ's headship? And is it far greater than that of Adam? Let us continue our study and find out more about His, his resurrection and the new life He gives us freely. Welcome dear friends to another study of Romans with Through the Bible. Let us today listen to our Lord as He speaks to us through His Apostle Paul on the headship of Christ and the types of sanctification. So let's begin. The Headship of Christ Romans 5.15 But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath bounded unto many. We have much more in Christ. Today we are looking forward to something more wonderful than the Garden of Eden. As the writer of Hebrews tells us, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Hebrews 11, 13 Romans 5, 16 And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Now I recognize that this is a difficult section. And this is one of the most difficult passages. To simplify it, all this section means is this. One transgression plunged the race into sin. And one act of obedience and the death of Christ upon the cross makes it possible for lost man to be saved. Romans 5.17 For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace 
and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Paul had previously stated, verse 14, that death reigns as king. Death came to the throne by one man who committed only one offense, that is, the original sin, the one act, involved the race. Here Paul presents another kingdom which is superior to the kingdom of death. It is the kingdom of life. It is offered to the subjects of the kingdom of death through the superabundance of grace. Man has only to receive it. The king of the kingdom of life is Jesus Christ. The gift comes through him. Romans 5.18 Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. This is the underlying principle of the imputation of sin and the imputation of righteousness. This is the doctrine of the federal headship of the race in Adam and Christ. Romans 5.19 For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Here Paul sums up his argument on federal headship. Adam's one act of disobedience made all sinners, not just possessors of a sin nature, but guilty of the act of sin. Christ's obedience, his death and resurrection, makes it possible for God to declare righteous the sinner who believes in him. Romans 5.20 Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. When God gave the law, he gave it with a sacrificial system. Then later on Christ came to fulfill that part of it also. In other words, God has given to the human race, a lost race, an opportunity to be delivered from the guilt of sins, not the nature of sin. You and I will have that old sin nature throughout our lives. Romans 5.21 That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. As sin hath reigned unto death, you and I are living in a world where sin reigns. Do you want to know who is king of the earth today? Well, scripture tells us that Satan is the prince. He is the one who goes up and down this earth seeking whom he may devour. See 1 Peter 5.8 Sin hath reigned unto death and the cemeteries are still being filled because of that. Even so might grace reign through righteousness upon eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. He is calling out a people, out a lost race and he is teaching turtles to fly if they want to. However, the turtle nature doesn't want to fly. Man is alienated from God. He has a sin nature. Now God offers salvation to a lost race. The claims of God's righteousness are fully met in the death of Christ. The kingdom is fully and firmly established on the cross of Christ. All other ground is sinking sand. The believing sinner now has eternal life by being united to the last Adam, the raised and glorified Saviour. This makes possible the sanctification of the saved sinner, which is the theme of the next chapter. Chapter 6 We discovered in chapter 5 that sin has come through the headship of Adam and that sanctification comes through the headship of Christ. Because of the natural headship of Adam, sin was imputed to the human family. But there is another head of the human family and that is Christ. He brings life and righteousness. He removes the guilt of sin from us and on that basis he can move into the lives of those who trust in him and begin to make them righteous. That is, he can begin to make them good. Now here in chapter 6 we begin with what I have labeled as positional sanctification. Let me say a word about this matter of sanctification. There is a difference between justification and sanctification. These are two words from the Bible, my friend, that you ought to cozy up to and get acquainted with. 
there is a difference between merely being saved from sin and being made the type of folk we should be because we are separated unto God. Identification with Christ for justification is also the grounds of our sanctification. We are in Christ. These are two different subjects, but they are not mutually exclusive. Justification is the foundation on which all the superstructure of sanctification rests. Now let me put it like this. Justification is an act. Sanctification is a work. Justification took place the moment you trusted Christ. You were declared righteous. The guilt was removed. Then God began a work in you that will continue throughout your life. I believe in instantaneous salvation, but sanctification is a lifelong process. In other words, justification is the means. Sanctification is the end. Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Justification declares the sinner righteous. Sanctification makes the sinner righteous. Justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin. Sanctification removes the growth and the power of sin. God is both an exterior and interior decorator. He is an exterior decorator and that he enables us to stand before him because he has paid the penalty and removed the guilt of sin from us. But he is also an interior decorator. He moves into our hearts and lives by the power of the Holy Spirit to make us the kind of Christians we should be. God does not leave us in sin when he saves us. This does not imply that sanctification is a duty that is derived from justification. It is a fact that proceeds from one. Or rather, both justification and sanctification flow from being in Christ. Crucified and risen, the sinner appropriates Christ by faith for both his salvation and his sanctification. We are told in 1 Corinthians 1.30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Up to chapter 6, Paul does not discuss the holy life of the saint. From chapter 6 on, Paul does not discuss the salvation of the sinner. He wasn't talking about the saint and the life he is to live when he was discussing salvation. Now he is discussing that. Therefore, the subject of this chapter is the ability of God to make sinners whom he has declared righteous, actually righteous. He shows us that the justified sinner cannot continue in sin because he died and rose again in Christ. To continue in sin leads to slavery to sin and is the additional reason for not continuing in sin. The believer has a new nature now and he is to obey God. This section delivers us from the prevalent idea today that a believer can do as he pleases. Union with Christ in his death and resurrection means that he is now our Lord and our Master. He gives us freedom, but that freedom is not a license, as we are going to see. Positional Sanctification Romans 6.1 What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul is being argumentative. He wasn't, you remember, when he was discussing sin, rather he was stating facts. He wasn't trying to prove anything. He just looked at life in the raw, right down where the rubber meets the road and said that we are all sinners. However, now he uses this idiomatic question which opens this chapter and he is argumentative. In the Greek, the question is asked in such a way that there is only one answer. He precedes the question with, What shall we say then? After you see God's wonderful salvation, what can you say to it? Our only fitting response is, Hallelujah! What else can you say to God's wonderful salvation? Now Paul's argumentative question is this, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And this, my friend, is God's answer to the question of whether after we are saved, we can continue to live in sin. The answer is, God forbid, or perish the thought, or may it never be. Romans 6.2 God forbid, how shall we, that are dead to sin, live any longer therein?
The very fact that Paul is asking this question makes it obvious that he understood justification to mean a declaration of righteousness. That it did not mean to make a person good, but to declare a person good. Justification means that the guilt or the penalty of sin is removed, not the power of sin in this life. Now he is going to talk about removing the power of sin. If God has declared you to be righteous and has removed the guilt of your sin, then my friend, you cannot continue in sin. The answer is, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin? That is something that is misunderstood. We are never dead to sin as long as we are in this life. The literal translation is, How shall we who have died to sin? Note this distinction. That means we died in the person of our substitute Jesus Christ. We died to sin in Christ, but we are never dead to sin. An honest person knows he never reaches the place where he is dead to sin. He does reach the place where he wants to live for God, but he recognizes he still has that old sin nature. It is verses like that that we have led a group of sincere folk whom I call super duper saints, I hope I am not being unfair to them, to feel that they have reached an exalted plane where they do not commit sin. One such group is a branch of those who teach the victorious life. They feel they have reached the pinnacle of perfection. They are different brands of these, I know. Dr. Vernon Maggie gives us an example of one group who were especially obnoxious several years ago in Southern California. A young man approached him following a morning worship service and he asked, Are you living the victorious life? But Dr. Vernon Mirgi shocked him when he said, No, I am not. Then he asked him, Are you? Well, he beat around the bush and didn't want to give a direct answer. He said he tried to. So one and Maggie replied, Wait a minute, that's not the question. You asked me if I am living it, and I said no. Now you answer me, yes or no. And he was not able to answer him. Like most of them, he was a very anemic looking young fellow. One and Maggie suspected he was a fugitive from a blood bank. He continued arguing his case. Well, doesn't the scripture say, I am crucified with Christ, and doesn't it say that we are dead to sin? One Maggi replied, no. That is not what the scripture says. We died to sin in Christ. That's our position. But we are never dead to sin in this life. You have a sinful nature. I have a sinful nature. And we'll have it as long as we are in this life. He persisted. Then what does it mean when it says we are crucified with Christ? And to that he replied, When Christ died over 1900 years ago, that is when we died. We died in him and we were raised in him and we are joining now to a living Christ. This is the great truth that is there. I don't know about you friend, but I am not able to crucify myself. The very interesting thing is that you can kill yourself in a variety of ways, by poison, with a gun, by jumping off a building, but you cannot crucify yourself. Maybe you can drive the nails into one hand on a cross, but how are you going to fasten the other hand to the cross? You cannot do it. How are you going to crucify yourself? You cannot do it. My young friend, you were crucified over 1900 years ago when Christ died. With that, he ended the conversation. Romans 6 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? This again is a verse that has been misunderstood. If you find water in this verse, you have missed the meaning. What did Paul mean by the word baptize in this third verse? I do not think he refers to water baptism primarily. Don't misunderstand me. I believe in water baptism and I believe that immersion best sets forth what is taught here. But actually he is talking about identification with Christ. You see the translators did not translate the Greek word but rather transliterated it. They just spelt it out in English. 
because it had so many meanings. But here in Romans 6.3, Paul is speaking about identification with Jesus Christ. We were baptized or identified into his death. In 1 Corinthians 12.13, Paul says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. We are identified in the death of Christ, as Paul will explain in the next verse. Now Paul is going to say that there are three things essential to our sanctification. Two of them are positional. One of them is very practical. For the two that are positional, we are to know something. Every gadget that you buy has instructions with it. When I buy a toy, I take it out of the box and I try to follow instructions for assembling it and sometimes it's very difficult to do it. Well, living the Christian life is such an important thing that it comes with instructions. There are certain things we are to know and we are to know that when Christ died over 1900 years ago, we are identified with him. Jesus hung on that cross because of my sin that put him there and your sin that put him there. We were identified with Jesus Christ that day. That is something that we should know and it is very important for us to know. Let's close here, dear friends. Do take the time to reflect on your own life. Being born of Christ, do we yet willfully sin? Do we identify with his death? For it was our sin that he paid the price for. So God bless you as you reflect on his word. Well, friends, I hope you enjoyed today's study of Through the Bible. I hope you are thrilled to know that you are identified with Christ on the cross. Christ took your sins with him to the cross. And by his death, we too have died to sin. And through his resurrection, we too are raised to a new life. I also hope you are glad to know that though through one man's offense, you enter into judgment and death, God has graciously bestowed you with an abundance of life through His Son, Jesus. And this gift of grace is far greater than the sin because it gives you life. It gives you hope and fills you with joy to await the day when you will receive the crown of life. And all we have to do is believe. Christ is the life-giving water that will never become scarce. And if we accept Him, he will reside within us as spring that gushes out life-giving water to quench our soul and our thirst for God. Men were made sinners because of one man's disobedience, but through the obedience of one man, we are all saved. And that doesn't mean that we must continue to disobey just because we have a nature of sin embedded in our flesh. We need to submit to God's will and follow His lead that leads to salvation. We have died to sin and no longer should we live with it. Instead, we should lead a life of faith. As we come to a close, remember, through Christ's fulfillment of the law, God has delivered us from the guilt of sin, but not from the sinful nature that will be in us through our lives. Yet, if we accept and believe, God will walk within us and transform us into a person of righteousness. Never forget that you have been declared blameless and free from the penalty of sin. But through sanctification by the work of God within you, the growth and power of sin over you is obliterated. Now that we identify ourselves in the death of Christ, don't you want to know about your identity in the resurrection of Christ? So stay tuned to the next episode of Through the Bible. God bless you.